Hello, friends, and welcome into the award-winning Rates and Barrels podcast. <laughs> you know, the award-winning from last Congratulations week. on both your gold and silver. Yeah, exactly. You can <laughs> pat me on the back. Good job, buddy. You tried hard, and then we can have a firm shake for we did it. Yes, because uh, in the Baseball Pods tournament, Rates and Barrels won, and it beat my, sh my, my show in this league. So as everyone did, everyone did the Spider-Man meme for Welsh. They're like, Welsh is Spider-Man meme, but uh, I can obviously take very, very little credit for here. Uh, you guys do such a great job, and uh, everyone will be pleased to know. I believe Derek Van Riper is returning on Wednesday. I believe he I'm back very on Wednesday. pleased to know this. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> you're like, I gotta get I'm Al and Walsh the host. hell out of here. <laughs> no, have no, host, have you been hosting the Wednesday ones too? I've, ha I've had to do the hosting on the Wednesday ones, and okay, I'm so, not good at it. So you're like super excited. You're like, thank you, DVR. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited to see DVR back too, uh, from his uh, hiatus, much deserved hiatus, uh, having a newborn baby. So we can all congratulate him and uh, I have very very much enjoyed you know by the way not only doing which uh, as far as I know we're going to be doing regular project prospect on Tuesdays but getting an extra episode with you and getting to these Mondays I very very much enjoyed and I hope listeners have as well so thank you my friend for uh, making it very very easy transition and really having great conversations with me mm -hmm. I appreciate it it's been it's been a pleasure it's also uh, been tough to do uh, five podcasts a week and so um i think you will be doing more than one a week for us we will need you to step in and help because uh it is it's a lot to do a podcast every day as you know so yeah well um, i've enjoyed it and i've enjoyed uh i really enjoyed all the positive comments everybody said uh, about rates and barrels and uh every everyone that listens you should take uh pride and ownership as uh, pushing this podcast up because Eno and uh, DVR have created a monster and I am just thankful to be a part of it. And today I'm excited to talk about uh, out of prep time. We're out of all the draft time. It's over, uh, essentially. I'm, I, you might have another draft or two on Tuesday or Wednesday coming up here, but uh, we are going to get you guys set because the moratorium is off of the main event. We could talk about the main event, Eno and I. I'm going to tell when we get there. Uh, we're going to talk about how Eno did and what the team looked like and everything like that but there was a player that Eno and i were talking about this whole time and i'm gonna see if you ended up getting him but the moratorium on the big main events there so we're gonna be talking about that there is some latest news and everything like that but i want to remind you guys you can check out everything that uh, Rates of Barrels and everyone else has to offer. If you sign up today over at theathletic.com slash Rates and Barrels, sign up, get a membership. It's only a couple bucks. Sometimes I got the dollar deal going on. I think it's been $2. Go and sign up. You're going to get access to everything. Maybe you still have a draft coming up in the next couple of days. You can get the tool and the draft kit. Uh, My Dynasty is up there. And a fantastic article, which I actually want to talk about for a second. It's Eno's 10 bold predictions for the season. Very well written, well thought out article. And you guys can get the full list of 10 names if you uh, sign up at The Athletic today. So go and do it at theathletic.com slash rates and barrels. But what I want to ask you, you know, uh, I read through your article. A couple made me very happy. I'm going to just spoil one immediately, but I'm not going to say the exact, but your Lars Newt bar prediction <laughs> just it makes me very happy for how invested I am in Lars Newt bar. It's a great one that's on there. And maybe that's going to come up here, but I do have a question for you. And I'm also going to have an answer to this. Of the 10 mm. that you put together, great written stuff, which of the 10 in your bold predictions makes you the most nervous of any of these? And I'll save mine for after, but as you were writing them, you know, some may become easier than others. I've done lots of bold prediction videos and stuff, but there's always you a mean couple. You nervous like it's not going to happen. Like, like maybe I, it's the, the least. The yeah, biggest, it's the biggest um, stretch. You know, it was one yeah. that you really had to like dig deep for, or you think that has the maybe, I think a few of them might have some really high possibilities in there, but like which makes you the most nervous of not hitting of all of those? I can ask you which you like the best. Oh, but I, I think, I think this one, I think this one is not going to happen. <laughs> the one I have? No, Corey Seager wins the AL MVP. I, you know, I wanted to put in uh, the the new rules. I wanted to have something in there about the shift. Uh, you know, the if you want to know how the sausage is made with my bold predictions, a lot of it just has to do with the research that I do in the off season, the the different uh, you know leaderboards you hear on this podcast, the different kind of things that we talk about. And so you've heard on this podcast that Corey Seager hit the most line drives to the pull side uh, over ninety miles an hour in the right angles. Um, and I wanted to put that in a piece somewhere. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, I like Corey Seager. I like that he makes contact, makes powerful contact. He's the lefty. He's going to benefit from rules, but Shohei Otani is a 
beast. And he's not even really the only guy that Seager has to swim move past. I mean, there's like Vladdy, Vlad Guerrero Jr. could uh, be an MVP. I mean, who are the... The projections. Uh, I think you had Trout, Otani, Judge are like the top three. So, it's not the same league, Soto, but yeah, Judge obviously. Uh, if I and one of my other bold predictions was that Trout, uh, that, which I stole from Ian Con, by the way. If you're listening, Ian Con, thank you for that Mike Trout one. Um, uh, I, I said that he would hit his the most homers of his career, and um, in an effort to keep Otani in town. And uh, and Trout is projected uh, for more wins above replacement than Corey Seager. So and it, so there's my bold predictions kind of going head to head each other up. Yeah, Trout really hit 50 homers and not win the MVP. You know, so uh, you know there's a there's some internal inconsistency sometimes. But I'm just trying to get a couple right. I, I mean, I'm I'm hoping for three. Last year I got two right, and I became I was three homers short from Nate Lowe. If Nate Lowe had hit three more homers, I would have gone three for ten, and three for ten is my normal one. But I got I was about to say bold prediction. Right, and I got uh, the Washington Nationals having the worst pitching staff in baseball. Right. <laughs> that's a pretty easy one. Bold prediction. That was an easy much, one. <laughs> that's a pretty good one. Uh, you actually have another pitching staff one that people can read in the article. It's a very good one. Um, it's very much like baseball. If you can just hit 300, you're doing great. You're doing yeah. Because great otherwise, they're not bold enough. If I'm if I'm getting five out of ten right, then that's just more like projections. That's just more like you know what I think is going to happen this year. You know. Also, what's interesting about bold prediction uh, predictions is like. I feel like with just a tiny bit of time, they can look irrelevant. Like I did a bold prediction show like about 10 days ago. And one of my bold predictions at that time was that Anthony Volpe would break camp with the Yankees and win AL Rookie of the Year. And at that time, I think that looked bolder. It was a pretty bold prediction, especially with Rookie of the Year. Right now, if you were to like listen to it or if I had written it down, read it, it would look not as bold. It wouldn't look mm, quite right. as bold. Like now that he's broken camp and um, you know his odds have moved, his odds were seven or eight to one about a week ago they moved up to five to one on uh, al mvp it's a, or al rookie of the year it's essentially gunner henderson uh masataka yoshida and him now are the top three in the al side the one that stood out to me in your article because there's a lot of big names there's a lot of like you talk about like one of the best staffs but this one just jumped out to me and it was um in your top five of ryan mcmahon is an all-star this year with the rookies and i'm really curious if you would expand on it in the article you talk about you know just a more aggressive approach on pull heavy fly ball guys which i think has something to do with it of course but um you know you put him pretty high in this list and i thought this would be the one that might be a little bit more volatile but again it is like top five so just maybe some quick thoughts on ryan mcmahon uh, making your breakout article or bold predictions yeah it's just uh you know when i look for breakouts on the pitching side for example this is a digression but if i'm looking for break breakouts on the pitching side what i'm listening for is oh i've got a new pitch i've got a new grip i've I'm throwing, I'm, I'm changing something about the way I pitch. And then you add that to maybe some small sample strikeout rate surge. And you're like, Ooh, there is something different here. Or I got a velocity reading and Oh man, he's got an extra couple of ticks like Reed Detmers or something. You know, yeah. that's what I'm looking for on the hitting side. It's a little bit less obvious what, because the hitting is so complicated, but on the hitting side, when I hear something like what uh, Ryan McMahon said, where he said, I want to be aggressive on when like I want to, tr he said, I want to trust my eyes. And so basically saying he's want to be more aggressive, which is another way of saying, I want to get the ball out in front, you know? And so he's saying like on the swings that I do take, I want to take aggressive swings and get the ball out in front. He is a let it travel guy in the past. He was 207th out of 270 or something in terms of, uh, in terms of pulling fly balls. So he doesn't pull fly balls. He lets the ball travel and he hits it all over the field. And that works to some extent in Colorado. But we know that he has pretty good raw power from his max EV. And then we know from the spring that he hit the second hardest hit ball in front of the machines. And so what I'm pairing is a change in approach with a change in results. It is the hardest hit ball he's ever hit. And so I'm pairing those two together to say Ryan McMahon is going to hit 30 homers this year. It's uh, it. boldish because he's he's really settled in at sort of 20 to 24. He doesn't seem like a 30 homer hitter, 
But in terms of age, it's a it's a good time to to make a guess like this. In terms of peak age, he's right there in the middle of his peak, and there's uh, there's a couple pieces of evidence around it. I like it. You guys can go check it out. Like I said, sign up today, theathletic.com slash rates and barrels. Or if you're already got your subscription set, then don't worry. You can check it out. Eno's bold predictions for the season is available for you on the app. You can check it out on some tweets and I highly suggest you go through it. It's a good read if you've got any last minute uh, drafts that are coming up. All right. Some news and notes we have got. Well, there was here. one. There was one in there that actually can segue for us a little bit. Oh yes, yes, yes. We were talking about you and I. Were actually, were talking about um, the. It's funny enough. We were. It's, this is a cool moment for me. I always love my Eno moments. Where before we started up the show, we were listening to uh, Joey Votto. We were listening to Joey Votto talk today, and I had told you I was telling you just random stuff. I've got a couple of random things uh, to add to some of the news, but Joey Votto had played a low a minor league spring training game yesterday and he traveled which that's a unique thing for veterans to travel by the way and what's so cool about that is if you ever see it in the spring these guys just jump in their car they drive down to the stadium in the parking lot they jump in they play they get in their car and they leave and that's essentially what he did and i was like hey Votto's starting a little on the bit IL. more possible in arizona maybe <laughs> yeah yeah exactly maybe not florida and yeah. uh you know he comes and he plays and i'm like oh, i thought that was interesting because he was playing on the il and you just happen to have this video up where Votto was asked about talking about about his favorite guys in the rotation and that was yeah kind of I mean, some transition. love to, to see trent rosecrans actually um he tweeted out today uh that Votto said he was quote still working through some of the rehab process not accumulating enough time in the field not accumulating enough at bats yesterday was the first day where i felt semi-close to being able to play close to 100 so sounds like he's around 80 percent i don't know i'm guessing the numbers in there <laughs> close to close to close uh, but uh, it may not be a long time that he's down, but I'm also a little worried about a guy coming off labrum surgery when it comes to how much power is going to come back. Um, but yeah, when I was scrolling through uh, Trent's uh, uh, Twitter feed looking for that quote, um, I found this excellent interview uh, there at the, at the press conference. And in my bold predictions, I say that um, the Reds top three of Graham Ashcraft, Nick Lodolo, and Hunter Green are going to give them the uh, the first uh, big three. I define that as two and a half wins above replacement. So that's top 50. So the first top, you know, three top 50 starters, 25 and under um, since uh, 2008 when the Giants did it with Tim Lincecum, Jason Schmidt, and Jonathan Sanchez. Wow. So the, tr the the trend in baseball, I think, has mostly been away from the young starter. We saw somebody like Grayson Rodriguez, who seems like he's super ready. Uh, he got sent down today. Um, and we see them slow walk starting pitchers all the time. Brandon Fott, you said, was more ready than anyone. I mean, he had yeah. all the innings and he got sent down. So uh, we're seeing a trend away from young pitchers. But the Reds are going to pitch all these guys. I, the stuff likes them, and uh, you know, I think that they can succeed. So the 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 interview was... Uh, Votto said something about debates they're having about which of the three is going to be the best. And Votto's hilarious because he goes on this whole two minute thing about how Hunter Green has this fastball and and Lodolo's hard to pick up and how how he gets reactions at first base from people and uh, and uh, how Graham Ashcraft is hard for people to to hit and. Uh, he's supposed to come to a conclusion where he's supposed to tell them who they, who he, thinks. and he led up to it too. He's like, so you want me to answer which of the three is the yeah. best. And that's, and then he kind of has a big pause. And then what was his answer? You know, and he goes, Alexis Diaz is a fine closer. <laughs> <laughs> and you and I just started busting up laughing. Cause I was in the background because I, um, Long thing, but you know uh, that Vado was involved in this uh, event with Tops earlier in the year, and there's someone I know that actually asked him the question, and he had just responded like Lodolo, like he's like, "Hey, who do you like?" And they literally asked it from a fantasy perspective, and and Vado was very respectful, saying, "I really like both of them, but I would go with Lodolo." So while this video is going on, I'm like narrating it to Eno. I'm like, "He's gonna say Lodolo. He's gonna, gonna say, say Lodolo. Lodolo." And I'm like, "Here it comes," <laughs> and then he's like. Alexis Diaz is really good. And then we, we, we loved that. We loved Boston. Right. Uh, so smart trailer. though. There was, a, there was a, a little bit in there that was really smart that um, I'm still trying to figure out how to research and how to get right. But um, he said they're operating from such a high ceiling when it comes to stuff that when they make yeah. adjustments that will kind of reduce their stuff and make them more effective, because they started with such great stuff, that adjustment's going to work. And 
anybody who's been listening to this knows we talk about how to account for how many pitches a pitcher has, how they work together. Now, obviously, stuff is 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 defined off of the fastball, so there is some interconnectivity. I'm not not just looking at each pitch uh, in a vacuum, but at the same time, there's something about weak contact, um, something about how uh, uh, hitters can start to over time get used to your shapes. So if you throw more pitches, you go deeper into the game. That's a fact. Um, and so there's something that's beneficial about just having a pitch that they don't see very often. And, and so that's what, that's what I think Votto is kind of talking about. It's like, Oh, Ashcraft may start throwing a curve. That's not as good as a slider or his cutter, but gives them a different look and gets them a few stolen strikes and gets them a few ground balls when he needs them. You just sparked something in my head that might end up being a really dumb question because you probably covered it a million times, but how many pitchers or who are the best pitchers that can manipulate shape as games go on? You know, like there is a shape to, let's just say fastball, there's fastball shape. Are there a lot of pitchers that you know of that in game can manipulate the shape? Because the thing that made me think about it was, um, I was actually watching this breakdown video, this pitcher that was like, I wanted to throw this, like, um, it was, I'm forgetting who it was, but it was this pitcher who pitched against Juan Soto and he was so excited and it's a dream come true. And he went through his whole narration of his approach and he was like fastball here. I don't know. This is a look me pitch. And then the, the strikeout pitch, he goes, I wanted to throw the slider because I, he hadn't seen my slider, but the catcher said fastball up and he strikes him out, blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking about that, that that's obviously an approach for many pitchers is to be able to, you know, use a pitch, maybe in a second at bat that the pit, the guy had not seen. But when you get into third and fourth at bats, are there guys that can manipulate shape better than others? And who are those? Again, if this is a very stupid question that has been discussed. No, it, times it's over. pretty smart too. Cause like the trend right now is to have gy- like have a gyro slider and a uh, sweeper slider. And um, we're going to have to be pretty smart to capture all those in the uh, tracking systems because they might, you know, on pitch the com, shape might make it into sliders. something else. Yeah. Yeah. And so, for example, John Gray last year was throwing a gyro slider and like his normal gyro slider and the sweeper at the same time. And I don't know that my numbers were picking that up completely correctly. Um, and uh, so that that's that's an example. And so my broader answer to you is, you know, remember, we used to say that the changeup was a field pitch. And um, and I think that's not untrue. But if we were ranking pitches based on field pitches, I would actually say breaking balls are even more of a field pitch because you have guys that have three breaking balls. How many people have three changeups? You know what I mean? Like, so, you know, guys that have three breaking balls already have to have a lot of feel. They have to be able to, quote unquote, spin it. That's one of the things that we're looking for. And spin it doesn't always mean the highest spin rate. It means a feel for spin. It means an ability to manipulate the shape. And sometimes that lends itself to three distinct breaking balls, or sometimes like a, a Griffin Jacks or a Matt, Matt Whistler. Matt Whistler? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Whistler? Well, yeah. Whistler. Matt, right? Whistler. Yeah. Weisler? I think, yeah. I yeah, let's go with it. Anyway, you guys know what I'm talking about. The guy who throws a we're, 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 we're doing different shapes of his name, so keep going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's all part um, of the context of the, the <laughs> well, Yeah, or even a Romo. Like, um, you know, those guys who throw 67% sliders, I guarantee you that all of them have two sliders in there. It's interesting. So, I would say generally the breaking ball, the guys with the best breaking balls, they have multiple shapes they're hiding in there. Yeah, and I'm even wondering about like manipulation of shape on, um, you know, maybe not even like breaking pitches, and if that's like if that's something that's very advanced right now, or I, everyone's very focused. I have on heard shape about it only from one person, and uh, it's a persona non grata, but it's too good to not talk about. So Trevor Bauer told me that, um, you know, he would be facing uh, um, Alex Bregman and. Alex Bregman is also a really smart hitter. And so Trevor Bauer said that he knew that Alex Bregman was training to hit the top half of the ball when he threw Bauer through his four seamer. So he was trying to get on top of that ride. Right. And that's been an adjustment that Marcus Simeon has made. Other players have made in order to hit the good four seamer. You kind of have to aim at the top half of the ball. 
and then you kind of get it flush when the ball meets as your bat. You know what I mean? It's kind of tricking your own brain. So Bauer knew that Bregman did this, and I, I even had the video at one point, but Bre Bauer actually manipulated the ride on his fastball and took ride off. See, this is, that is, this is exactly what I'm talking about. This is exactly, you're breaking down at like, I'm wondering about the players in game who can find that ability to manipulate shape. If that is like a new video I had, I swear to God, Bregman looks out at Bauer. He, <laughs> uh, like Bauer throws one Bregman tops it foul. And he looks back at Bauer, like what the F was that fastball, you know? And then mm -hmm. Bauer throws another one and he grounds out. And, and I think Bregman's like looking and I even, I think I even asked Bregman about it and he's like, yeah, I, I was wondering what was up with that fastball. So I would say again, it's the guys who throw a ton of them. So why Lance Lynn, he throws like six fastballs. Right. And you know, he told me he throws a BP fastball, you know, that doesn't show up. There's no, there's no, you know, pitch tracker that's saying like, Oh, he throws 5% BP fastballs, you know, but uh, Lance Lynn's probably usually better than his stuff plus numbers. And part of that is because he can manipulate the shape on all his fastballs. Very interesting. I'm, I mean, you are literally the person for the perfect person for that to come to my mind to ask. I couldn't think of a better person. And that's what Max Scherzer says when he says he hates stuff plus because he thinks that uh, he thinks that feel is much more important. And I say field should show in location. Field should actually show in stuff plus eventually because you're replicating good shapes and that's what it's about. But uh, I have some, I'm not, I'm not going to discount what he says. It's not like stuff plus is, is the one number that makes every picture make sense. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, there are always outliers. You're like, this guy's much better or much worse than his stuff. Plus Nick well, you've mentioned like change-ups, change-ups don't <laughs> work well. You, you, change-ups you've had issues with on stuff plus. And uh, uh -huh. if you, obviously if you're seeing guys manipulate shape and stuff like that in, in pitch, it's going to affect what the numbers look like. So uh, any of them are imperfect systems, but you know, at the same point, it's still probably one of the best metrics that have been out there. So mm -hmm. great answer. I'm glad that you had that. Uh, just was kind of <laughs> jumping in my mind as I think I even asked you this in that last episode episode of like how sweepers and gyros are becoming the new trend you just wonder and i was wondering like what are the next trends and, and i know you and who like, can actually command both of those pitches you yeah know? when you had answered like change ups going in, and change ups going into splitters were kind of like your maybe next you know bastion of, of pitches yeah we're like, working on a piece about about the rise of splitters i mean it, it, like just coming off of that japanese uh you know pitching send you know staff in in the wbc splitter yeah. after splitter after splitter after splitter you know yeah, well, maybe we'll see some more ship. Um, we'll see some more shape manipulation that's going to be going on in the future as part of it as well. Well, that's, uh, we got know, some... that's what Gossman says about his changeup too, right? Like he has that Fosh grip, and he it you know when he really wants to to drop off the table, he he throws it deep in the fingers and, and lets it really sort of fall out. And then when he wants to kind of control a changeup, maybe for a freeze take or something, he thinks that someone's spitting on his changeup. He'll he'll hold it a little bit differently and throw it a little bit differently and, and get less action on it, but but be able to do that. So anybody who has an elite pitch and throws it a lot, I think has multiple shapes in there. Ooh, do you think <laughs> article idea then in the future? Would you ever be able to I would be fascinated to have identified the top shape manipulators um in baseball that would be really fascinating mm. to see probably not I mean, it's easy. so hard to study though because like like well let's say you did like probably standard deviation guys yeah what if you did standard deviation on on pitch types right like standard deviation on movement you could just have a guy who has no idea how to replicate the shapes <laughs> it's not that he's trying yeah. to replicate different shapes it's just like he can't he can't replicate the shape on that pitch or like the biggest nastiest pitches that have the most movement will always just show up as having the biggest standard deviation because sometimes it's 24 inches and sometimes it's 20 inches and that's much more than someone who throws like a tight little gyro slider when it's like off by a half inch or something you know what maybe I mean? it's something hitters have to answer maybe that's a hitter uh answer to that uh, question where hitters, and, hitters this year. yeah they identify Who's good at manipulating the shapes on their pitches yeah that would be really fascinating to see uh we got some news and notes and then uh we got to hit some main event here and uh, actually one little uh curtail to the main event uh you know and i were talking a lot before it and uh uh, Anthony Volpe was a lot in our conversation. This was someone that you obviously wanted. You don't have to uh, disclose yet if you got it, but well, we got official news. I didn't get him, and it and and it was uh, it was more just that 
it wasn't I was necessarily trying to hide it. It was more just that the, the hype machine, it was trying to I was trying to gauge where the hype machine was at. And there's always just a relationship between the hype machine and the cost and what you're willing to pay and the risk. So, you know, at that time at the main event, which I did on Friday, um, Volpe was kind of chugging along towards maybe making it. But I still had my reservations because I was saying like Westberg, you know, he he got sent down today. You know, uh, there was other uh, people that seemed just as close. Grayson Rodriguez, I thought he was going to be an Oriole and he got sent down today. Um, and so uh, that doubt plus the performance doubt, because now that Volpe has made it, he could still just be met, you know, like it's still a possibility as much as people like him. So you combine those two and it was just still too much to pay. The hype machine had gotten going the early main event drafts in New York City with Yankees fans that were pretty sure uh, that he, the Volpe is going to make it, I think, push that price up and. Uh, just went in a place that we couldn't handle it. Yeah, there, there was a, I think I even text you about it like on Thursday because like it really picked up steam, I think on Wednesday of last week where it really started to go and that didn't help. But we got official word between, um, between I think Sunday and today as we're recording this, that Jordan Walker, Anthony Volpe, Oscar Colas, and then as of this morning, Bryce Terang, all big prospects that were breaking camps with their teams. A couple of players, obviously, uh, maybe to our surprise, didn't. But Walker and Volpe. Walker is pushed, I think, inside of most people's top 100, just in case you do have a draft coming left. I have thought if Volpe was given the gig, he belongs right around the top 100. And Colas, I think, is still pretty, pretty being slept on for making the opening day roster. But one note is Volpe's going to hit ninth, which also could have, you know, little tiny effects in there. Um, I mean, but in good, my draft, they all got there. Yeah, in my draft, uh, Volpe went in the 10th round at 141. Uh, he went ahead of Glaber Torres. Uh, he went ahead of um, Matt Chapman, Carlos Correa, Cabrian Hayes, Jonathan India, Ryan McMahon. Uh, we took a shot uh, on Grayson Rodriguez at 167. And so I think if a Volpe had been there at 167, we might have taken him. That was the earliest that we could really see taking a shot on a veteran. The What we passed, uh, like we went, we were at 141, Volpe went, at uh what did i say 140 yeah one. it's right here somewhere come on where are you yeah i thought you said one we went at, was there anyone? oh he, he volpe went at 141 we picked at 137 so i guess we could have taken him we were pretty focused on getting innings at that point because we had been planning on having a two ace uh format but we got a late pick in the first round and so we took corbin burns and then juan soto um at 14 and 17 mm. and since uh we then didn't pick again for so long um we weren't comfortable with taking any of the starting pitchers that were available to us when they came back to us so we so took, you needed to later in the draft start focusing on pitching right so we took romano time. and uh lindor at the next turn that's the tough thing that happens we'll talk a little bit more about the main event here in just a tiny bit that's the tough thing that happens in drafts when players kind of have their like stationary level of where they go based on what you do. Sometimes it's not that you don't want a player, but you just price yourself out based on draft necessity. And that happens right. plenty of times. It, it happened in a couple of drafts I did where I wanted Corbin Carroll, but you know, I pushed and needed pitching kind of in that general vicinity. And I think that's ended up happening with Volpe. Uh, I want to get back to the main of it here in just a second, but a couple other pieces uh -huh. uh, with both of the big prospects breaking camp, which is awesome. And it's going to be a big payoff for people. Wander Franco had a scare this week. And, and it's a big scare for me because I drafted him all over the place because I think he's going to have a big bounce back this year. But luckily, it looks like it's all good and he's going to be re ready for opening day, which was a huge scare for me. You know, I don't know if you're a big buyback on Franco this year. Well, I, I, I am. I, I think that he's the key for the race season. I think that he's I mean, I think it's about health to some extent, but I'm not ready to say he's injury prone. I mean, the things that have happened to him hit by pitch, you know, a little bit of a hamstring thing. It's I, I'm not I'm not saying he's injury prone yet. And so a full healthy season will give him the chance to make the adjustments to unlock some of that power. I think we've seen the raw power. And the real thing that's waiting, you know, I think he's a maybe only like a 10 to 15 stolen base guy in terms of speed, but he could be anywhere from a 15 to 30 homer guy. 
Yeah, totally. That's, that's, that's a good way to put it. You're hundred percent right. With high, high batting average and hitting right. in the middle of an order, you know, runs and RBI could definitely like a 280, 30, 15 season is totally within his grasp. But the the power, I think, is where the most oscillation is between his upside and downside. Yeah. I mean, and he's also in the same breath, he could be a 325 homer, 10 to 15 stolen base guy, and he could be mm -hmm. 85, 85 plus on run and RBIs. You just never know uh, with how it goes. But I'm a big buyback on him. That was a little one of those scares. Uh, obviously, I, I imagine you and um, Al talked about it, but, you know, like Reese Hoskins right before the season start was like a huge blow for a lot of people. Um, and that kind of changed the landscape. We keep having the landscapes change on positions. First base is fine, but it was everybody was kind of like banking. All right. If I don't get the elite guys at the top, I can still go get one of you know, uh, Hoskins or Cron or Walker or Rowdy Telez. And then those kind of have moved away. I was a little bit worried. This is going to be another one of those with all my shares, but it wasn't luckily. Um, Kyle Wright is going to be getting the season on the IL. I'm, I'm kind of down on Kyle Wright. I wasn't big on him this year, even though I felt mainly because I felt like there was a lot of paying for what he did last year on and his command staff. kind of spiked. Yeah. I, I was a little bit worried about it overall, but the IL is going to, have dropped his cost a decent amount, but either way, he's starting on the IL for the season. Um, one note, Keston Hira, just ugh, prospect people like me designated for assignment and uh, going to be seeking a, um, a, a trade partner. The brewers are otherwise they're going to outright release him, I believe. Uh, so pirate here might have, they, they never okay. have needs for anybody, right? That seems right. I mean, they also had just, uh, they're such a young team that they could option somebody down that like, even like, even over Rodolfo Castro, I think he has options. So if you wanted to uh, option Castro down and just give here a, you know, a month. Yeah. Castro has one option left. So you could option Castro down and give Hira a month at second base and just see if you care to see more you know who was that team you were saying the other day that did that at the end of the year where they were just picking the, up the guys? giants the giants did it at the beginning of farhan's uh, tenure where they just they went through connor joe you know uh mike stremski a bunch of other players where they just kind of cycled through players i'd be interested wow. if the royals considered doing it maybe there's another one yes, of those the royals teams. need pop yeah that might be one of them um and then the last note here is juan soto who you mentioned you uh, ended up drafting. And I was on the backfields today and I got to watch him play. And he played in a simulated minor league game. Joe Musgrove actually pitched. He pitched five innings. We can talk about that in a second. That's another one of those that are good. But Juan Soto had a bunch of at-bats. He was playing the outfield. He wasn't DHing. He looked really good. And then right after it, Kevin AC who's a Padres reporter was there, talked to him after. And then almost immediately after I watched him walk off with Kevin, it was reported that it looks like he's going to uh, be good for opening day, which probably gave a discount. You clearly got the discount at what'd you get him at 15? Yeah. We got him at 17. 17. Yeah. I yeah. mean, you kind of talked about that prior last, week that he would be a guy that would drop so i mean 17 that is a huge discount if you were doing the main event today what do you think he would go for now that he's good uh i don't think that he would jump a bunch but i think he'd jump into the back end of the first round um, you don't I think, think he would jump into the 15, top 10 13 something like that i don't know I don't know. Healthy. It's one of those things where the projections love him the projections say he's going to have the second best year of his career um, you know, people in San Diego, I think, uh, to some extent doubt that because they felt a little bit jilted by his performance when he came over, you know, and I think that people who were watching him in the playoffs or watching him in San Diego when he kind of uh, got a little bit more exposure, uh, like in terms of recency bias, aren't aren't super into him. So I I'm not saying that there's a big divide on Juan Soto, but you know, it's easy to say, Oh, he won't, how many bases is he going to steal? And you know, blah, blah, blah. And maybe he's not suited for the new ball and, you know, but projections love him and maybe you're right. Maybe he'd sneak into the top 10. I think he would, but I tell you all of these leg issues. He said, I really question what he's going to try to steal this year. I mean, this is oh, like, yeah, the his third his thing. Sprints are going down and like, yeah. Yeah. yeah early. Yeah early spring and then right before the WBC. And then this again, I really question what the speed numbers are going to look like. So I think it's way fair. You had a really great point in the last episode you and I did together where it's like, 
Jordan Alvarez versus him. I'm not sure if Soto's not stealing. He's much different than Alvarez, and Alvarez might be safer at this point. There's better more interest in Soto. I'd probably give Alvarez, but Soto is also going to benefit from the shift rules more than Alvarez because Soto does hit ground balls to the pull side. That's a good so. point. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, he looked good out there, though, just to let everybody know. They like said he took, it looked like way more at bats. They didn't have a full squad. They're playing against the Mariners, and the Mariners, you know, wasn't great pitching. They had like Tommy Lastella was the best player that was playing with them. And um, they were every inning cycling through. So I want to say he got five or six at bats on there. The other interesting one was Joe Musgrove pitched that entire thing, and it looked like he pitched what was relevant to about five innings. And I was being a little snoop. I was being a little sneaky snoop over because the dugouts right here. And I heard him talk after he was all done and he was sound like he was on cloud nine. He said he felt great. And, you know, I also heard him say that he was experimenting with a different grip for a changeup. I, and, and I'm just telling you what I heard him say. I was standing five feet from him and I heard him say that it felt really good with this different changeup grip that I didn't hear who he said, uh, showed it to him, but he was out there using that. And I thought that was extra sneaky and that he was out there pitching five innings in a minor league game probably is going to show like what a great discount, maybe one of the few injury discounts that Musgrove was coming into the season. And I kind of loved the changeup thing. Yeah, it's the it's the toughest thing about spring when you get these uh, you get these spring updates on injuries and you don't you don't know how to react and then people overreact. But see, uh, there's an example where people didn't overreact. Carlos Rodon, there was more pressure uh, on him downward in the rankings than I thought. And the newest news is he's going to miss more time than they originally thought. And that's that's the risk where you're like, I don't want to take an injured guy who's injured right now because then, you know, what what happens when they when they get the update? Oh, he's he's not responding as well or oh this other thing hurts or whatever yeah, good you know point. so um i can see why people do it uh i think with soto the our bet was just that the upside was so high i think musgrove my model has always really liked and so i would have taken the shot if it made sense in, in our main but um you know with pitching also i'm just a little bit less likely to pull the trigger on someone who's currently uh, yeah hurt. take any risk yeah, yeah, take any risk on. I, I like that it wasn't like some arm fatigue issue or something like that with him, but he was as jacked up as I've ever seen him. Uh, pitch great, love the results, throwing some changey grip uh, just to be on the lookout for in season. Maybe that'll be a bigger thing. But you know, when he was going in the 60s and falls to the 90s, there's a pretty good discount. I would feel good if I was doing a draft in the next couple of days to be able to just boost him up a little bit. I did snag him in a few spots. Uh, speaking of drafts, that takes us to the main event. Will you give us a little experience too? Because you went out to Vegas, correct? No, I did not. You did In not. In fact, you, if you anybody a... okay. is out there thinking about doing a main event next year, um, one uh, sneaky bit of knowledge is to uh, break in on the main events that are during the Vegas weekend, uh, but are online. Because most of the guys who go, most of the people who go to Vegas to draft in person um, don't aren't going to do an online one while they're there. And Ooh. so you can kind of Get the sharks um, out. break in without as many sharks. Yes. So uh, oh that's that was that helped me along to my third place finish last year. Um, and I'm hoping uh, I've got a I've got a listener who is uh, my co co-manager on this. And, uh, and, uh, we've, we, we wanted to do things that we didn't end up doing, but we also did a lot of things we wanted to do. So that's uh, what I wanted to ask you is what was the pre, but we're going to look at the team and have you list off some of the team, but what was before, not what you ended up doing, but what was the pre prep conversation of like how you wanted to attack your draft? Like what, what goes into it for you? Yeah, so I mean, the, the main thing for us was because we have so much good ADP uh, knowledge that we can see what other teams have done uh, in the past, what other drafters have done in the past, we were able to uh, look at what would happen in different lineup slots, you know, in different, what they call KDS, which is Kentucky Derby System, which is, in the beginning, you tell them which where you want to draft from. And then they, then they pick, basically they give you your slot based on, based on luck. It's like a draft and order for picking your, for draft the draft order. order. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and so we, we basically said, okay, what would happen if we picked one through three 
we would have this available. We'd have this available. We'd have this available. What if we happen to we draft in the middle? We'd have this available. And we kind of planned out the first maybe five, six rounds for the beginning, middle, and end just in, in text back and forth. Oh, like if we it. do this, well, this, this will be available to us. So what we decided was we really liked the top three, actually, because what we wanted to do was get two aces. We found that there was some research by the, the Birchwood brothers on fan graphs that said that main event winners um, spent more on pitching than other teams and that uh, teams that were closer to a 50-50 split uh, on investment in pitching uh, did better. And so we thought, you know what, there's, if we could get 400, if we get 350 innings of just studliness at the top of our draft, that's what we want to do. And so we really were hoping for a beginning that would go Jose Ramirez, Shane McClanahan, and, uh, and Brandon Woodruff, which looked like it was mm. possible uh, if you looked at ADP. It didn't end up being possible. We didn't get that draft slot, but if we would have gotten that draft slot we would have gotten jose ramirez and then we um we we would have gotten shane mcclanahan but brandon woodruff would have gone at, would would have gone and then we would have had to either pump up kevin gossman or take a bat so even if we even if it gone the way we wanted to we would have had to make a decision in the third round that we didn't want to okay. um and so you know that's what happens every plan that you make uh you know goes to crap at some point and so uh, what happened for us is we got the 14th pick. <laughs> and, which is was that not the last we plan, by the way, when you were like, you want the top? Was that like at the bottom? It was one of the plans? worst. The, okay. the, actually, the very worst for us was like 8, 9, 10, because then we saw a top six bats that we wanted. And so we didn't like 8, 9, 10. It was you'd have to kind of pump up Mookie bats, uh, you know, more than more than ADP says you should or take Vlad Guerrero and not get any speed. So. We didn't like eight, nine, ten. We did have fourteen, fifteen ahead of uh, ahead of like 10, 10, 11, 12, something like that. So um, we did we did get uh, uh, Corbin Burns as our number one. We were I was really hoping for Mookie Betts, but he went two ahead of me. Um, and so we took Corbin Burns, and then on the backside we took Juan Soto, who who fell. Um, uh, Pretty strong Tatis, start. Tatis and Spr Strider went in between. Uh, we figured he would take one pitcher and we figured that uh, either Soto or Manny would be there for us on the way back. Um, and you and prioritize so, Soto over Manny. Yeah. In that case. And okay. so we took Soto. And then on the way back, what we were hoping for was Luis Castillo to drop to us at three um, where we were picking um, where we would be picking at uh, the end of three, 44. So we were hoping Luis Castillo would go to 44. Guess where he got picked? 42. <laughs> and we said, well, if Castillo is gone, then maybe Wheeler makes it to us. Well, Wheeler went 43. And the next starting pitcher after Wheeler, there's a bit of a shelf there. The next starting pitcher was 57. And uh, anyone who listens knows that Shane Bieber is not one of my favorites. So uh, we didn't want to pump up uh, Shane Bieber 15 points. So we went with Jordan Romano. Because at that draft slot, we knew that Ryan Helsley uh, and Ryan Presley and a bunch of the other guys wouldn't make it back to us. Yeah. Uh, which was true. None of them made it back to us. We wouldn't have had, we wouldn't have had a top end uh, reliever, not even uh, Felix Bautista make it, made it back to us. Wow. So that's, you mean that's from f the fourth to the fifth round? Because the third round you took Romano. And then what was your fourth round pick? Uh, our, our fourth round, uh, Lindor. Lindor. Okay, so, so you got Lindor. I thought and Lindor no was like back. Soto was just like a bat who fell too long, you know. Lindor yeah. was going in the back end of the second at different times of the drafts this year. So we took Lindor in the fourth, and we thought thought with Lindor and Soto, like had a good bat base with Romano and Burns. We had a good pitching base, and we thought that most of our options were open from there on out. And you kind of covered everything. You got your infielder, you got an outfielder, you got a relief pitcher, and you got a starting pitcher. So that's a that's a strong core four. So where did you go in round five when none of those relievers came back? Uh, yeah, we would we would have had to take Camilo Duvall, uh, who we liked, but we think that the Giants are going to spread the love around. Um, and so, you know, if Duvall had been our number one reliever, I think we would have been a little bit um, disappointed. So... Uh, what, but since we were no longer looking at pitching when other people were looking at pitching and relievers, uh, we did a fun MI double tap 
uh, at five and six and went Tim Anderson and Andres Jimenez. And mm. our plan had been to skimp on steals, but we both like Tim Anderson. We both like Andres Jimenez. Andres Jimenez is a 95th percentile uh, sprint speed guy. Love Jimenez there. You know, and Tim Anderson, we thought would keep our batting average afloat. And uh, we got two shortstops. We thought we might create a little scarcity in shortstops too, you know, uh, by having Anderson and Lindor. And we we just went bop, up up and just finished off MI, you know? Like I did we, the exact same thing, by the way, in a league this weekend where I went Corey Seager and then I got Franco a little bit later and I paired both of those guys in a draft. And then I think my, I think my second baseman was Jimenez as well because I'm obsessed with Jimenez. So uh, I really went heavy. I did the exact same thing. I like the strategy. Yeah, the other thing we found looking at this was that the ADP versus auction value, um, calculator value, uh, was all out of skew for catchers, and we thought getting good catchers was a was a was a uh, was a was a strategy, you know, that would work for us. Unfortunately, uh, you know, it didn't work out in terms of who was available. Like we really wanted Will Smith, but you know. It wasn't available at the right times. And so uh, at seven and eight, we got Logan Gilbert for more uh, more innings that we thought were high high floor and high ceiling innings. And then MJ Melendez, who may, along with Varsho, lead the catching position with plate appearances. And we picked MJ Melendez over Wilson Contreras and started a heck of a catcher run by picking Melendez because Contreras went... Alejandro Kirk went, Tyler Stevenson went, Sean Murphy went, and William Contreras went all in the eighth round. Wow. So people so we kicked off. Yeah, we kicked off a, a little mini run there. God, that feels good. Doesn't that feel good when you do that too? Because you're like, yeah. And you got take, the guy you wanted. <laughs> you're like, I got my guy. Now you guys just waste all these picks with a guy I wouldn't take. So my players come back to me again. Oh, it's such a good feeling. Yeah. I feel it. I don't know if we need to go through every pick, but I do. The no. next pick is interesting because – Another thing that I had uh, uncovered in my research for AL labor, but also just generally, is that mid-tier first basemans were a value this year. So I think you've, uh, I ha this is, none of this stuff is really stuff I've hid from you. The catcher thing we kind of showed up when we were doing research specific to the main event, but uh, you might have noticed me talking about Josh Naylor from my AL labor. Uh, draft and how much I like Rowdy Telez. He's been uh, all over my pieces. And and so Rowdy Telez, Josh Naylor. Um, let me see if I have my main event prep still open, but um, main prep here. First base. First base, there's a, a, a mini tier here of guys who are still worth a lot. Josh Bell is worth $13 in the main event. Rowdy Telez, $14. Andrew Vaughn, who is talking about pulling fly balls, which would change his abilities, his upside completely, $13, just the way he's projected. Anthony Rizzo, $13. Josh Naylor, $11. Ty France, $8, $9. So that is a super value tier because those guys are going around 200 You know, Also, Vinny Pascantino is projected right in the middle of that, and he's the one going 93. So he was mm -hmm. almost on a do not draft for us. So we had two, we had those guys circled where we were like, these guys are all going around 280p. Let's get our guy. So Rowdy to Les, we got him at, uh, let's see here. Where is he? We got him at 134. God, um, and the, the best part was we also got Naylor and we got Naylor at 197. So we got our first baseman. Uh, from the scrap heap, but I don't feel like like I don't feel like they're scrap heap guys. They're both going to benefit a lot from the new rules, and uh, and so we just thought that they were good values where they were, and that's our those are our first basements. So yeah, and also uh, just out of the article, also got Ryan McMahon. Ryan McMahon made the roster. Uh, people can check out as well. And uh, McMahon, we got we got one sixty four. He's a he was a bold predictor. Yeah, we got, uh, uh, and then of course you always have to leave something on the side. And so we, after we took Jordan Romano, we said we're not going to invest heavily in second closers. We think those have really bad outcomes. That's something I've said on the podcast before. And so we got our lead guy Jordan Romano, and then our second closer is C C Craig Kimbrell, 
And then we took a shot on Hunter Harvey in the reserves. So that's our steal. That's our save strategy. Uh, the other one, the other thing that we left on the wayside because we really wanted to hit up the middle um, with innings. So we got Burns, Gilbert, Montgomery, Turnbull, Tyon, uh, Savali, uh, Grayson Rodriguez, Ryan Nelson, Kenta Maeda. So we wanted a lot of like veterans starting pitchers we thought would have innings. Outfielders fell apart. So we had Soto and yes, then we, so we had Soto, which we took 17 and we took our next outfielder, Ramon Laureano at 227. I was about to say, what is that? 190 or something 200 like that? picks in between outfielders for us. So, uh, you know, if there is, and I, I've talked about this meme before with the three dragons, uh, you know, we've got our lineup, we got our rotation and the, 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 the dragon oh, with the googly yeah. eyes <laughs> is our outfield. It's Juan Soto, Ramon Laureano, Trent Grisham, David Peralta, and Trey Mancini. We got another mid-tier first baseman and we got him to play outfield. He's hitting the ball harder this spring. So, uh, and then Max Kepler, who's on, uh, I probably have him on like half of my teams. Okay. Uh, heavy investment. So. How, how did you feel coming out of it though? That last thing. Um, I feel thing great. I feel yeah. really great. I feel we've got power. We've got speed. Uh, Fancy pros gave us a B and said batting average is a risk, but with Rowdy uh, and uh, Grisham and Naylor we ha and Kepler, we have four of the biggest beneficiaries from the shift rules. So we're hoping that if those guys can get their batting average up at all, uh, then we'll, we'll be all right. And then in terms of a, a, a staff, Burns, Gilbert, Montgomery, Turnbull tie on like the, the, I think this is a good staff. And then we wanted to have a lot of major league pitchers on our bench and Ryan Nelson, Hunter Harvey and Kenta Maeda on our bench in the first week. That's pretty good. I think. Yeah. So. Ryan Nelson taking the gig, Dre Jamison moving to the bench. That's news uh, too, right? That's yeah. news too today. Ryan Nelson got the gig. That was another one, you know, and lastly too, uh, our boy, Estory Ruiz, made the uh, made the roster official, and he'll be out there. Someone I was trying to target in an AL only league, and got sniped on it for the stolen bases. So, uh, would have liked to have seen you got him with all all the criticalness of like oh, I don't know that would have been fun funny. If you had him on. There. I don't, you know, I try not to. I'm not playing games with people. Um, I know there's a fine line, you know, with the main event and trying to keep your cards close to your vest. Uh, yeah. I try to, you know, the Volpe thing I, was maybe a little misdirection, but I don't you were think transparent. so. You, no, you, I, were tra I, you were transparent. I, I just expressed my doubts. And while I have uh, some hopes for him to be really good, uh, you know, it still just, just didn't make any sense where he was going. So, well, also uh, a guy that wasn't on the 40 man. They had those old Peraza who was on the 40 man. No, I think oh, you were very transparent across the board. I'm just saying it would have been fun for a guy that you're critical of as Trey Ruiz for him to have made the team for the stolen base. There's a price for everyone. Been. There's a price for everyone where it makes sense. You know, Agreed. no matter what, you know, if I, there's, I don't, I don't, I said Vinny Pascantino was on a draft list, but if he'd fallen to, you know, 150 or, you know, 170 where we think he should have been, then we would have taken him. So there's always a price for everyone. That's right. Uh, that is going to do it for the episode, my friends. Thank you guys for hanging out. You can find me on Twitter at is it the Welsh? You can find Eno at Eno Saris. And of course, you can find us right here at Rates and Burials. You guys can rate and uh, review and subscribe to the podcast, do all that stuff. We'll be talking prospects tomorrow for Project Prospect and then DVR back on Wednesday. Make sure you're on the YouTube channel on the app and on your podcast app for all of the stuff and things. Thank you guys for hanging out with us today. Season is only a couple days away. So get your last minute draft prep in. And if you need more draft prep, athletic.com slash rates and barrels. The draft kit is still out there to help you and a whole bunch more. Go read that uh, bold predictions article. Maybe implement that into your draft prep. $1 like, a month know, right now. $1, One dollar a month right now. That's sick. $1 a month. <laughs> athletic.com slash rates and barrels. I actually did that quite a while ago before I was uh, lucky enough, everybody, to get a free yes. uh, subscription now that I'm doing hosting. But I did. <laughs> I don't look at me. That was yeah. part of the athletic. Extra one dollar a month in your pocket. I got my dollar to do literally. You remember when you could like be like, "Hey, a dollar a month could do." What can you get for a dollar right now? Yeah, you can't get I anything. I can't do anything with a dollar. But if I save it up, I could get a cup of coffee on a week. But um, <laughs> I had that deal going on leading up into this, so you guys should All do right. the same thing. Dollar a month, ridiculous. Get deal go check it out theathletic.com slash rates and barrels that'll do it we'll talk to you tomorrow right here on the athletic i'm welsh that's you know bye-bye thanks for listening